William Green, one of uh, the century's finest writers, a man of peace who has shown through his career that he was troubled by war, died several weeks ago uh, while the world was at war. And one of his last public statements on BBC Radio had to do with the whole question of the coming of war and how he felt about it. And he said, the klaxons of war are upon us. The engines of war wait with machine-like intelligence for the final fury. We are captured by the bloodlust for battle. But where is the resistance to revenge, the prescience of destruction to follow? Where are those with dignity and strength of purpose stand up to resist this war? Right here. We're here this evening to discuss this most important issue, the question of the future and the presence of war resistance in the United States and elsewhere. Unfortunately, Noam Chomsky will not be with us this evening. He's ill. He has a throat infection. But we'll do the best we can to stand in for him. We thank the John F. Kennedy School of Government and the Institute of Politics for making this possible. And also, I'd like to thank Rick Doblin, who personally helped put this together. Let me introduce in a second Dan Sheehan, who I'm sure many of you know. And then I'll say just a few words about how we'll conduct this this evening. This is an important topic, and since there's only two of us and many of you, what we propose is to speak a little bit, Dan specifically, and then I'll respond, and then open it up to questions, and then hopefully we can get through quite a few of them. Traditionally at the Kennedy School, most of the talking is done from here, and a lot of listening is done out there. Let's try to get a little bit more interactive process going tonight if we can. Let me just take a few minutes to introduce Dan Sheehan. I'm Kurt Campbell. I'm an assistant, soon to be associate professor at the Kennedy School, and I teach international relations and public policy. Dan Sheehan is the general counsel and public policy director of the Christic Institute, and he has played literally a pivotal role in some of the most important and paramount civil and human rights lawsuits during the last two decades. Very briefly, let me just introduce a few of the things that he's done. He was the coordinating counsel for the plaintiffs of the Greensboro civil rights suit, which I'm sure all of us know about. He acted as the principal attorney for Stacey Ann Meck, the first sanctuary church worker arrested for transporting Salvadorian refugees in Texas. He also worked, assembled, and headed up the team of lawyers who won a settlement for the family of Karen Silkwood. He also represented the New York Times, in the Pentagon Papers case, and has been involved in literally every act of public and private concern concerning America's military involvement in third world operations and wars. Why don't we open it up for a discussion? All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Kurt. <laughs> the, uh, the purpose of gathering together this evening is to uh, dialogue a bit about the state of the peace and justice movement here at the uh, end of the at least direct and immediate hostilities uh, in the Persian Gulf War. Also perhaps to reflect a bit upon the uh, previous recent military actions of the United States relating to Nicaragua and the various types of military endeavors that have been engaged in by the Reagan and Bush administration and to attempt to evaluate how effective the peace and justice movement is here in the spring of 1991. There has been a, a great deal of concern about this uh, in the midst of the Persian Gulf War. I've had the opportunity since arguing the oral argument before the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals on February 25th in the case of the federal racketeering lawsuit against Richard Secord and Albert Hakim and uh, Rob Owen and the others that is being prosecuted in Miami by the Christic Institute uh, to have an opportunity to visit with some of the cities around the country and to dialogue with some of the people that have been involved in the peace and justice movement over the past 25 years, there was an initial uh, feeling of great despair uh, within the peace and justice movement, almost uh, comparable uh, to the degree of elation on the part of people in the Bush administration and in the executive branch over 
the great success that they felt they were having with regard to the war in the Persian Gulf. Indeed, there was a great feeling as I went out to talk to people along in the, the Easter season and the uh, season of Passover that many people felt very much that they were being uh, crucified upon a cross of yellow ribbon. Uh, and there was a great despair that somehow the entire past 25 years of organizing and public education work since the original teach-ins back in 1965 against the war in Vietnam had somehow uh, been virtually a complete futility, that they had a sense that the peace and justice movement in the United States had just received uh, word that it was terminally ill, uh, that somehow the American public was suffering from an acute case of uh, political amnesia uh, and, in fact, was, in effect, politically brain dead. Uh, now, this was the, the state that I encountered when I went out, so I wanted to, to come together tonight to talk about, in, in a, a very disciplined way, uh, the state of the peace and justice movement here uh, and find out what condition it's in and what, in the opinion of those of us at the Christic Institute and those of us who've been working for 25 years, really needs to be done. Let me address the first question of how effective the peace and justice movement has been. And I want to juxtapose the, the effectiveness with regard to Nicaragua and, more recently, with regard to the Persian Gulf. Uh, one of the images I use in discussing this is if you just try to reflect upon the period of the Reagan-Bush administration, just remember each and every morning when Ronald Reagan got up how badly he wanted to invade Nicaragua. Just, just, just reflect upon that for a moment, that they had in fact gone so far as to prepare full-scale readiness exercises called Rex 84, where they trained the 82nd Airborne at Fort Bragg uh, to uh, lift off under the color of night, uh, under the darkness of night, and to descend upon Nicaragua and to overthrow their government and establish military uh, rule there. They had gone so far, as you know, to uh, practice rounding up undocumented Central American aliens in the United States to place them in uh, military detention facilities uh, under Rex 84 Bravo. And yet, because of the existence of the peace and justice movement in this country, they knew that they could not do that. And so they kept groveling, groveling for alternatives, of course, going to the Contras, uh, not their most enlightened move, I might add, uh, but eventually, once the Democratic Party got on board with them and had persuaded them that that was not the most effective way to achieve the objective of removing the Sandinista government from power, they joined with the Democratic Party to channel millions of dollars of covert monies into the election process in uh, Nicaragua to oust the Sandinista government financially. Now, while that is obviously not a, a clear victory for the peace and justice movement, uh, it does demonstrate the degree of effectiveness uh, that had been developed uh, since 1965 up to approximately 1985 over this 20-year period. However, with regard to the Persian Gulf, uh, there is a, a significant uh, discussion going on now about the effectiveness of the peace and justice movement. I tend to agree with, with Father Brian Hare the, uh, the counselor to the United States Catholic Conference of Bishops, that one of the achievements of the peace and justice movement was to impose a sense of obligation upon the administration to consistently discuss their desire to go to war in terms of the just war theory, the constant attempt to demonstrate that there was first a just cause to authorize military engagement, Secondly, that they had exhausted uh, every last effort to achieve peace. And thirdly, that they had prosecuted the war by just means, that the proportionality of the use of violence was uh, authorized. Now, uh, people disagree as to the substance of the answers to those questions, but never have we really seen before a war where the military feels obliged every day to come on television and take out their pointers and demonstrate how they're not hitting civilians and how they're directing these just against military facilities, uh, 
the long discussion of the question of when to use the military force to have a, a full-scale debate in the United States Congress watched by the American people to discuss whether this, in fact, is the time we've exhausted all adequate alternative remedies, uh, and the consistent discussion of the proportionality, the, in fact, refusal to discuss the number of casualties uh, to, to a, in response to that very issue. Uh, now, what I want to do briefly is I want to discuss the, uh, the positions taken by George Bush with regard to the, the just war criteria, and then to discuss quickly uh, various elements of the peace and justice community and the positions that were taken by these elements and to critique them in an attempt to, I think, and I hope, shed some light upon what may be a more effective way of addressing and deterring uh, military assaults like this in the future. Uh, first of all, you may remember that George Bush asserted that this was an absolutely unavoidable war, uh, that it had to be undertaken in order to uh, deter aggression uh, across a legitimately recognized uh, border uh, between Iraq and Kuwait, that this was unacceptable, this type of military aggression. He asserted also that it was necessary to go in to remove the troops of Saddam Hussein from Kuwait because they were engaging in a series of violations of human rights of the people in Kuwait once they had gone into that country. He then thirdly pointed out that uh, it was necessary for us to go in and undertake military activity because it was necessary to protect the access to oil, uh, pointing out that, uh, in fact, it was necessary to protect the American way of life and that he was going to go in, whether the United Nations authorized it or not, because he had to go in to protect vital American interests. Uh, fourthly, he pointed out that uh, he had to go in to destroy the military capability of Saddam Hussein because of the ostensible threat to the other countries in that area of the world uh, of military invasion by Saddam Hussein, pointing out that he'd invaded uh, Iran uh, earlier, that, uh, that the Saudi Arabia was subject to military assault, as well as Israel. Now, uh, after pointing out these series of ostensibly just causes, uh, he went on to point out that they had exhausted all relief, that there was no realistic chance of negotiating with Saddam Hussein, that he wasn't going to leave, that the, he was not going to undertake any conditions to the resort to violence. Uh, that he, but he needed to argue that there was no realistic chance of engaging in the debate and the analysis. And finally, as I pointed out, the, the extreme resort to demonstrating that uh, only military targets had been, had been targeted, that there was great care to make sure that no damage was done, uh, surely not intentionally, and even any ancillary damage that was done was of an absolutely minimal nature, you may recall. Now, there were a series of, that, that's the basic Bush position, as you recall. Uh, the response to that condition, you may remember, uh, almost of all of the segments of the peace and justice community, was then gauged toward responding to the issues of the just war theory. The initial uh, group that always has to be understood as part of the major peace and justice movement in this country is the total pacifist community. They, they asserted that under no circumstances should we resort to violence, uh, that we should negotiate, we should use diplomatic means, we should have economic embargoes, we should do all of these things, and in a sense suggested that this should be done as long as it was necessary to do. And we could resort to other nonviolent methods for as long as possible to extract the troops of Saddam Hussein from Kuwait. Now, this didn't fare very well. Uh, because uh, the, the fact of the matter was it was quite obvious that in the final analysis, if in fact it didn't work, the total pacifist community was not willing to use violence ultimately. And this was a, as an extreme weak point when you're dealing with a person whom you're in effect arguing on behalf of, like Saddam Hussein. He was one of these type of guys that, you know, if you, you know, with a guy like this on your side, uh, you don't need to have an adversary. You know, he was tending to say things, do things. Uh, his rhetoric of, uh, of high violence and rather picturesque uh, threats and, and things were, were not at all helpful. And so I think that the, the segment of the peace and justice community that was devoted to total pacifism was not very effective 
in deterring this particular uh, military operation because of the conduct of Saddam Hussein. Now, within the remainder of the peace and justice community, you have, of course, the, the classical uh, left position, the secular left. Uh, this, is a, this is a group that ranges from the kind of uh, moderately democratic socialist on down to the old CP people and new CP people. People tend to be Marxist in their analysis and intensely secular, uh, devotedly resistant to any concepts of theology or other things, in, in fact, decidedly so. This particular group, uh, represented, I think, by perhaps Phil Agee, uh, Noam Chomsky, uh, Ramsey Clark, some of the others who, who made their move very, very early and very, very aggressively to condemn uh, the intentions of the administration. They took positions all along the, the line. They primarily asserted that Bush's assertion that he was going to go in to protect the American way of life was what was the primary driving motive here. And uh, the, they went into a long analysis, as was pointed out in Z Magazine by, by Phil Agee and others, that what this really was was nothing more than the capitalist class moving to secure access to resources, to maintain the massive military budget, to fund the corporate uh, contributors to the Republican and Democratic Party. It was a, a full-scale anti-capitalist analysis. Now one, of the, now, one of the difficulties that was run into uh, by this element of the peace and justice community was that they had a terribly difficult time agreeing to criticize Saddam Hussein. You may remember this debate that broke out within the peace and justice community. Uh, there was a great resistance on the part of the, the secular left community to sort of placate George Bush by saying anything negative about Saddam Hussein. And there began a fairly intense internal debate between uh, this part of the community and the more religious, traditional uh, groups who were perfectly willing to critique and criticize Saddam Hussein for what he had done, uh, but went on to point out that what the response was on the part of the United States was improper. Uh, and within this more religious and softer uh, group in the, the peace and justice community, the, the classical 60s, generation, if you will, a lot of us, uh, from, that were born between 1945 at the end of World War II and before the assassination of President Kennedy in 1963. This usually delineates the 18-year baby boom. In fact, uh, demographically, it defines exactly the, the rise and drop back to the normal birth rate of the baby boom. This constitutes 75 million American citizens, 44.7% of the eligible electorate. This group uh, is not commonly understood to be hard left. They're not understood to be uh, very uh, doctrinaire, uh, not understood to have much of a, a Marxist analysis or economic analysis at all. In fact, came out of the kind of gastronomic resistance to the Vietnam War and then sort of evolved into various groups of analysis of why they disliked wars, particular wars, and why they disliked the administrations. Democratic and Republican, uh, the lack of trust on the part of this entire generation of the World War II generation and their parties. Now, within this, within this softer group, uh, I think that there were leadership positions that were taken uh, by a lot of the, the religious community, the social ministry communities, if you will, uh, of the peace and justice community. Uh, Brian Hare represents part of this group, the Catholic uh, community because of the major role that the Catholic Church plays uh, in Latin America and had come to play a significant role in the consciousness of this generation because of the activities in Chile and El Salvador and uh, more recently in Nicaragua and Central America and Guatemala. The influence of the Catholic Church, the liberation, uh, theologians, etc., cetera, uh, is quite important. The analysis that was followed is, uh, is not entirely satisfactory. Brian Hare, I think, is a, is a legitimate spokesperson uh, for this part of the community. And while they expressed great reservations about the proportionality that was uh, in store uh, in this war and expressed great concern about whether or not the last resort uh, was actually uh, being resorted to in the use of military power, ended up 
in a sense, justifying uh, this war by saying that there was armed aggression uh, in combination with the violation of the human rights and that there did seem to be a legitimate potential threat militarily being posed by Saddam Hussein against Israel and potentially against Saudi Arabian oil fields. While they, didn't, they aren't convinced that it was, it was convincing that he was going to engage in further military action, there was enough concern about it that uh, they thought that the just cause part of the just war theory tended to just barely overbalance the reservations about the proportionality in last resort aspects. Now, that is a, uh, an analysis that ended up, in a sense, just barely authorizing this war. Well, needless to say, George Bush and the administration didn't need much more uh, than just a little bit of justification from this part of the community. So the, the Catholic Church didn't play a really dominant role in opposing this war. I think that uh, the, the National Council of Churches played a much more significant role. The Protestant denominations, the Middle Eastern division of the National Council of Churches, headed up by Bishop Browning, the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, you may remember, uh, was invited. He happens to be the personal priest of George Bush, who is an Episcopal, at least nominally. Uh, and that he, George Bush, rather theatrically invited Bishop Browning to come and be his pastor in this anguished moment of having to decide uh, what he'd already decided, quite obviously, some time ago, uh, to launch this military strike in January of, of 1991. And you may recall that Bishop Browning absolutely refused to come to give any sense of endorsement to this action. In fact, participated in a demonstration outside of the White House condemning this as an unjust act. Now, and played a major leadership role along with Bill Whiffler, Father Bill Whiffler, inside the Middle Eastern Division of the National Council of Churches in helping to facilitate the drafting of statements of condemnation of the military option in this particular case. Now, they tend to gravitate toward a, uh, an attack. Well, they, they agree with the Catholic analysis that the proportionality issues were of high risk and the last resort elements of the just war theory had not been met. They focused their attention legitimately upon the issue of the just cause because of this minor balance in favor of the just cause that had caused the, the Catholic thinkers to justify this, to allow the, the proportionality concerns and last resort concerns to be overweighed by the persuasiveness of the just cause elements. So what they have done is they have focused on, I think, an extremely important series of fact questions uh, that needed to be analyzed. Uh, they directed their efforts in research with Professor Michael Clare, of the, uh, who is an assistant professor of peace and uh, national security studies uh, at the five uh, college consortium in Massachusetts, UMass and Hampshire College, toward fact questions. And they have been moving progressively toward a conclusion that the assertions of the Bush administration that they had to go in to fight aggression, the, the violation of an international border, uh, appears very much uh, to be the circumstantial evidence suggests that this was a choreographed and instigated event. And they point to a series of documents and data I want to review those very quickly because I think this will become the pivot point of attempting to remove that slight balance on behalf of the just cause that causes the Catholic community, the theologians at least, to tip slightly toward endorsing this war. What they've pointed out, there's an interesting incident that occurred quite colorfully. After the August 2nd uh, uh, incursion into Kuwait, you remember the uh, the Arab community wanted to mobilize very quickly to try to find an Arab solution to this border dispute to avoid outside interference. So they called an Arab summit conference in Cairo. And on August 10th, just eight days after the incursion, an extraordinarily interesting event occurred uh, in the Cairo summit conference uh, in the open debate. Uh, the foreign minister from Kuwait, uh, Foreign Minister Sabah, confronted Tariq Aziz, the foreign minister from Iraq, on the open floor in debate, 
and said to him, you nasty rascal, you people engaged in an act of unilateral military aggression against us, and you ought to be thrown out militarily. You're going to be in big trouble for what you've done here. He said it in, in Arabic. But uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, response, the response of Tariq Aziz was to stand up and confront him, and he said, you'd better be extremely careful about what you say to me in public because we're in possession of documents showing the meetings that you were holding in the foreign ministry with the United States Central Intelligence Agency working on a covert operation to get rid of Saddam Hussein. And at that point, the foreign minister from Kuwait passed out. <laughs> Literally passed out on the floor. Now, my investigators who pointed this out to us uh, suggested that this was not normal diplomatic conduct. <laughs> This is not the, the supposed reaction of a, an experienced diplomat to being accused falsely of something. And so uh, we began looking for the documents uh, at the Christic Institute. We uh, obtained copies of documents which, in fact, set forth uh, a, a memoranda, for example, written by the Director General of the State Security Department of Kuwait, dated November 14th of 1989. Now, this is some seven months prior to these alleged unprovoked incidents that went on with regard to uh, the border dispute. And what the, what the memorandum says, uh, in the words of the, the Director General of State Security of the Department of Kuwait, November 14, 1989, are as follows. We agreed with the United States that it was important to take advantage of the deteriorating economic situation in Iraq and to put pressure on that country's government to delineate our common border. The Central Intelligence Agency has given us its views as to the appropriate means of applying this pressure, saying that broad cooperation should be initiated between us and that such activities should be coordinated at the highest levels. Now, upon finding these documents, we proceeded to try to ascertain what happened in Kuwait shortly after that, after the November meetings. What we found out is that the Kuwaiti government very quickly after these meetings, moved a series of special oil drilling equipment up to the disputed border between Iraq and Kuwait. Interestingly enough, uh, equipment that had been obtained from an American company, a major stockholder in which is the national security advisor for uh, President Bush. Uh, and that's, they began slant drilling. They began drilling off at a 45 degree angle under the disputed border into the oil fields under Kuwait or under Iraq. And they began to pump hundreds of thousands of gallons in barrels of oil out of the Iraqi oil field and to sell it on the international market at prices dramatically below those being uh, ch charged by Iraq, indeed dramatically below the prices having been agreed to by OPEC. And when in fact, they were confronted on this issue uh, by Saddam Hussein. A series of meetings were held, and the brother of the emir of, of Kuwait became aggressively insulting to Saddam Hussein. Now, this is according to King Hussein of Jordan, who participated. And he said that after the meeting, he discussed specifically this issue with the brother of the emir of Kuwait. And the brother of the emir of Kuwait was quoted by King Hussein of Jordan as saying the following, we're not going to respond at all to their protests. Let them occupy our territory if they choose to. We're going to have the Americans come in. Now, this indicates that there, at least this is circumstantial evidence suggesting that these people in Kuwait, in the Sabah family, knew something was going on. And now, another very important thing that we discovered, as you know, the Christic Institute, as I'd mentioned, been involved in investigating the off-the-shelf enterprise of Richard Secord and uh, the various people who have been engaged in selling weapons. One of the things that we turned up in our investigations in our computers is an extraordinarily interesting fact that one of the members of the secret team of Richard Secord and Albert Hakim, a man by the name of Sarkis Saganelian, who runs Pan Aviation right physically next door to Southern Air Transport down in the Miami National Airport, uh, in fact had sold $50 billion worth of military equipment to Saddam Hussein. 
And as we began to investigate when the agreements were entered into to do this, we discovered that these agreements had been entered into under the Reagan and Bush administration to sell the military equipment to Saddam Hussein. So all of this noise that the Reagan and Bush administrations were making about all of this Soviet equipment in his hands and how they built him into the fourth largest military power in the world, in fact, had an extraordinarily important caveat here. And that, in fact, the secret team under Richard Secord and Albert Hakim and Sarkis Saganelian had sold $50 billion of this military equipment to Saddam Hussein, had created this monster, and had done so completely illegally since he was condemned as a terrorist nation and they were no, not authorized to sell the military equipment to him any more than the same group was authorized to sell the tow missiles to Iran, who had also been put on the restricted list. As we pursued this, we found an extremely interesting transcript in our computers. It turns out that in, on October 29th of 1985, there was a meeting that took place in Frankfurt, Germany, between, on the one hand, Richard Secord, Albert Hakim, and Oliver North, and on the other hand, the second channel for the Iranian government the relative of Rafsanjani, with whom they were negotiating the tow missile sale. And in the, the CIA transcript, which we fortunately have possession of, of this meeting, not only did, did Richard Secord and Albert Hakim and Oliver North promise to sell the tow missiles to Iran, but they also promised that the Reagan and Bush administration would take steps to see to it that they overthrew Saddam Hussein for Iran. Now, this struck us as fairly pertinent at least circumstantial evidence, suggesting that there were decisions that were being made ahead of time to do this. And as we pursued this, we discovered through Professor Michael Clare in the National Council of Churches Middle Eastern Division that, in fact, in mid-1989, when President Gorbachev had announced that he basically had intended to unilaterally begin to dismantle the Warsaw Pact and to withdraw unilaterally from the 45-year Cold War with the, with the United States, that while this was greeted with great joy in most circles in the United States, it was not greeted with great joy by everyone. And indeed, the leadership of the military uh, services inside the Pentagon, those concerned with the bureaucratic access to their continuing funding, and the, the leadership of the major military industries, who you have to remember had, had been given $3 trillion to build military equipment during the Reagan administrations, met this kind of re this announcement by the Soviet Union with great panic, and a series of memos began to be exchanged within the White House and back and forth between the White House and the Pentagon and several of the think tanks with regard to the Pentagon. And they began to argue about how they could maintain their place at the table in light of the statements and policies that were being adopted now by President Gorbachev. And the memos start to show that they had decided that what they needed to do to retain access to that level of funding to maintain their bureaucratic structures is they were going to agree to redesign the mission of the United States military services and that they were going to agree that it was no longer necessary to maintain major strategic warfighting capability. It wasn't necessary to invest billions of dollars in strata cruisers and stealth bombers and intercontinental ballistic missiles with independently targetable nuclear warheads. They would, in fact, argue that we wanted to keep the same levels of budget, but, in fact, transfer that money from strategic warfighting capability down to tactical warfighting capability, sort of traditional warfighting capability, tanks, uh, regular jet aircraft, armored personnel carriers, et cetera. But most importantly, inside these memoranda, they argue that they want to shift massive amounts of money into the logistical warfighting capability at a logistical level of low-intensity warfare, and that they were going to direct their targeting away from the Soviet Union in strategic warfighting to directing it against third world countries who would pose threats to the continued access to strategic raw materials on the part of the northern industrial nations. And now you begin to see the contours of the New World Order. The New World Order is transparently, according to the analysis that is now going on inside the Middle Eastern Division of the National Council of Churches, uh, this New World Order is not what 
George Bush says it is, that it's going to be a new world order pursuant to which the United States joins together in a multilateral way with other nations uh, under a, an agreed upon and openly debated resolution of the United Nations to join together in joint defense against international legal renegades. That is not even what happened in this incident. Because as you remember, he declared that he was going to invade whether the United Nations supported him or not. And that he was doing so unilaterally to protect American interests and the American way of life. That what they're talking about new, now is the new world order is an alliance among the United States, a new European economic community with a new reunified Germany standing astride the new European economic community and with the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe but not all of the Soviet Union. Let's sort of swing off those Slavic countries. Let's sort of get rid of those Mongolian countries. Let's, let's deal with the Caucasians in the Soviet Union, the kind of Europeanized Russians in that area. And let's have a new northern industrial alliance pursuant to which we will give international monetary loans to this, these countries to retool their industry, in their heavy industry in the, in the Eastern European countries, the Soviet Union, so they can produce cars and televisions and refrigerators and appliances, the things that these people have been wanting for all of these years. And when this Caucasian Northern Industrial Alliance has been solidified, they will turn their eyes to the South, to the Aboriginal peoples of the world, who may have the hubris to really believe that those resources that just happen to be under their property belong to them. And it's, it's likely that third world leaders will rise who will attempt to challenge that. Or indigenous citizens groups within those countries will rise to have an economic analysis that leads them to the conclusion that they have the right to determine the use of these materials. And that is the purpose of the new retooled American military. Now that is the new world order that is being perceived uh, and, in fact, given these memoranda being exchanged, they actually had come to the point by June of 1990 in two separate memos, one prepared by the United States Air Force and one prepared by the United States Army to actually name Iraq and Kuwait as a potential example of how they might have to demonstrate the effectiveness of this new war fighting capability. Now, all of that taken into account, when you see the reactions to the oil drilling, the slant drilling, and the mobilization on the border of Saddam Hussein, and then you see the response of the, the representatives of the administration, April Glaspie, who can't, you remember, quite remember what she said to Saddam Hussein. Uh, Fortunately, Saddam Hussein tape recorded the conversation, so he has less trouble. And when he asked her about this, she said on the tape, we have no opinion on the Arab-Arab conflicts, like your border disagreement with Kuwait. James Baker has directed our official spokesman to emphasize this instruction. And the very next day, I would assume, not coincidentally, the State Department spokesperson Margaret Tutwiler called a special press conference at the State Department, invited in the media, and gave the following answers to the following questions. Question, has the United States sent any formal diplomatic messages to the Iraqis about putting 25 to 30,000 troops on the border with Kuwait? Has there been any protest by the United States at the ambassadorial or any other level that you know of? Answer, I'm unaware of any protest. I'm aware that Mr. Kelly, the Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs, has had more than one meeting on this subject. Our ambassadors in the region are actively discussing this, but I'm unaware of any formal protest in any diplomatic jargon. Question, do you happen to know if the U.S. has any commitment to Kuwait to defend Kuwait or to assist it against aggression? Answer, we do not have any defense treaties with Kuwait. There are no special defense or security commitments with Kuwait. And two days before the incursion, the aforementioned uh, John Kelly meets with the Congress and makes a disclaimer of any U.S. commitments to defend Kuwait, stating that he has no, we have no intention of defending Kuwait if it were attacked by Iraq. Now, to suggest that somehow uh, this was a misreading on the part of Saddam is not, I believe, going to be accepted by this part of the religious community. And I believe that what we're going to be seeing is an increasing role of the religious social ministry community in the peace and justice movement taking the lead to condemn this as a violation of the just cause 
element of the just war theory, which even the administration somehow feels compelled to, to abide by. Now, so that is the type of new world order that we're facing. And the question arises as to what needs, what does the peace and justice community need to do to in fact prepare to deal with this? And in closing, I would say that it's extremely important that the secular portions of the peace and justice community come to a better understanding of what in fact the real theological understanding of the religious peace and justice portions of the community are talking about. Please, you know, give credit to the people in the National Council of Churches, the United, Union of American Hebrew Congregations, the Catholic Conference. These people do not believe that there is some white anthropomorphic male sitting up in this cloud somewhere with a scepter saying, this is right, this is wrong. There's something much more sophisticated going on here. There is a scientific reality to the theological insights that the religious community has. You know, talk with us, dialogue with us about this, accept some of the advice of Michael Harrington, who was the head of the Democratic Socialist Alliance, who in fact, before he died, wrote his, one of his final essays called Present at God's Funeral, in which he says the, the secular elements of the peace and justice community need to come to understand what the social ministry apostolate is talking about and join together in forming a liberation theology that will in fact produce a rationale of justification for the participation of the unlanded and unpropertied and the aboriginal peoples of the world in becoming part of the ruling class that pursuant to natural law concepts of theological discernment of the governing laws of the cosmos can participate in lawmaking so that they will become a legitimate part of the ruling community in Western culture. That's what has to be done. On the other hand, the religious portions of the peace and justice community has to engage in a much more aggressive demythologizing of these truths so that it can be understood in a more logical way and so that you can understand what the scientific cosmological issues are here that show that there is, in fact, a bonding phenomenon in the cosmos, an actual unified field in the cosmos, and actual faculties of discernment in the human family that are evolving biologically, like sight and hearing, that can discern these things, and that these gifts are possessed by the aboriginal peoples of the world, so that we become major advocates for the right of the aboriginal people. The fact is that the Soviet Union, as the antithesis to Caucasian, ubermensch, state capitalism, never were adequate advocates and, and proponents of the rights of the aboriginal people, never were trusted by the aboriginal peoples of the world to be their spokespersons. That is going to be the role of the religious social ministry community working with the poor and the oppressed to develop this theory of liberating theology, to stand as the fundamental, not adversaries to the national security state in the new world order, but as advocates of an entirely alternative world order a new actual order of the, of the entire human family. Now that is what is, needs to be done and we're facing a very crucial decade in which the Caucasian alliance is going to be worked at to be organized by Bush in this administration and in Yass, his next administration. And that is what's going to have to be worked against. And this alliance between the secular elements of the peace and justice community and the religious elements of the peace and justice community has to be worked out from both sides so that we can join together to become the effective partners with the people of the world to vision forth and to effectuate a genuinely new alternative world order. Thank you, Dan. Let me just make a couple of comments, and then we'll open it up for some discussion. I'll only speak a couple of minutes. I have to be perfectly honest. You lost me at the end, but uh, I'll try to address some of the, some of the points we'll, along the we'll, way. We'll have a theological discussion after this is over. Um, I'll be interested to see whether General Powell uh, will join the Caucasian leadership on the presidential ticket next, <laughs> next term. <laughs> <laughs> 
First of all, let me draw a distinction between two things before we begin the open discussion. And let me just point out, and I'll be done in a second, there are a couple of microphones about, and we'll call on you as we get started. I want to draw a distinction between U.S. policy in Nicaragua and the Gulf, first of all, and then also the decision to go to war, and then what happened after the war began. On the first part of the issue, I think actually we might agree. I think the system did work in Nicaragua. I think the American people and the American Congress were against intervention in Nicaragua, and I think we've seen very clearly a success in the sense of trying to override a policy which was not supported by the people. We had, I think, a free and fair election. It was mandated by the United Nations. It, we had many uh, whole teams of international advisors, including Jimmy Carter, and most agreed the elections were, 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 were fair. Um, so I think in that sense, I think we'd agree in terms of Nicaragua. Ten years of war. Now, as we take a turn and look at the Gulf, I, I believe that the Gulf – let me, let me, as a, be, be as a favor, yeah, um, he spoke be, be, for 50 make, minutes. Make the comments. Let me speak for five or ten, and then we'll open it up, and I'll be happy to listen to what anyone has to say. I think the Gulf War poses a more difficult challenge to the peace movement, frankly, and let me go into some of the details why. First, just a, a, a different history, very briefly, about the Gulf region. Kuwait actually has pumped oil um, out of Iraq um, through the process that uh, Dan Sheehan um, – um, Why not? Be polite now. Kuwait has yeah, actually you have your has, has, your has actually pumped oil out of Iraq for almost four or five years now, not just four or five months. And indeed, there have been problems between Iraq and Kuwait for some time. And frankly, it was my impression that the U.S. government, more than anything else, ignored those problems. Frankly, to our peril. Also, in the past, particularly in 1987, when we tried to escort tankers out of the Persian Gulf and we tried to elicit the support of the Kuwaitis, who are known to eschew any entanglements, frankly, they uh, said they were not interested whatsoever in having any kind of open alliance with the United States. And indeed, it's been interesting. In fact, many Gulf politicians will point to the Kuwaitis, the most uh, arm's length politicians in the Gulf, how they have embraced the United States as their saviors subsequently. I must say I'm, I'm confused by your chronology. I, I, I can't see what's in it for the Kuwaitis to allow the Iraqis to come in, completely destroy their country, and then have the Americans come to their rescue. We can get to that in a second, but that to me, uh, frankly, I, I stretches my, uh, my, my imagination. Secondly, I thought you would make the point that the United States tilted in favor of Iraq before the war, which was absolutely clear. We made a decision in the United States, and I think it's a decision that we will come to regret, regret to lean towards Iraq in the Iran-Iraq war and indeed helped arm Iraq against Iran, two very dangerous states during the latter part of the 1980s. And I believe that that policy persisted, and indeed, if anything, most policymakers in Washington were consumed by the changes underway in Europe, which essentially threw our bureaucracy into a tizzy. My impression was that on the wake of the invasion, if anything, there was not a conspiracy theory. I mean, if anything, Washington was asleep. The irony is how difficult it was to rouse the bureaucracy in the weeks and months after the war. Indeed, the difficulty here was trying to regenerate policy while uh, policy makers in Washington were either on vacation or consumed with events in Europe. Let me just get again to the question of the war and its, and its debate inside the United States. This is an interesting war in the sense that I think we did have an honest, open, uh, fair debate for six months in Congress and publicly. I don't think there was a bloodlust for war. I think, if anything, I speak for myself and people I know, there was tremendous apprehension about the whole issue of going to war and the concern probably more for American and allied casualties than for Iraqi casualties, but nevertheless a concern about the consequences of war. Also, uh, if you look at the ultimate alliance as it formed, there were 30 nations involved in it, including many of the states from Eastern Europe, newly free states for Eastern Europe that supported very fervently President Bush's um, appeals. It, it is an interesting case in the sense that um, I, I was one who believed that sanctions would work. And I was actually very concerned about the war. And I think I was wrong. I think time has shown that Saddam Hussein would not have yielded to sanctions. In fact, the incredible thing about Saddam Hussein is that he has remained in power given the pounding, given the two separate uprisings in, inside of his country. And that suggests to me a longevity, a maturity of totalitarian state that, per, frankly, I had underestimated, and I think many others did as well. 
I think the, the, the interesting point made about that many, particularly in the moral um, uh, left community, Brian Hare, Michael Walzer, argued that the war was just, just barely, or um, uh, uh, that the war clearly was over the mark in terms of a just cause, last resort, and pro proportionality speaks volumes, frankly, because I do think these are people that would be predispositioned to agree that this was not a war uh, that would be moral or just. The thing that troubles me is this: if this war had occurred in three or four years in the future, I have no doubt whatsoever that Saddam Hussein would have used nuclear weapons. I also believe that if the war had taken place six months from now and he had the capability to put chemical weapons on missiles, he would have done so against Israel. And that's a question that we can debate subsequently. My issue, though, is that I have concern about how the war has ended. It seems to me that if you go to war, um, first of all, you have to accept um, the consequences. And one of the things that Americans as a nation have forgotten are the terrible consequences of war. I think Dan Shin is correct to point out that, that we highlighted the precise nature of the war, but the fact is that war is a destroying, it is about destroying a society. In fact, Iraq, for all practical purposes, is destroyed. There is cholera, um, probably hundreds of thousands of deaths, and that's a tragedy. And frankly, I believe that if you make a decision to go to war, and I do believe it was a just decision to go to war, but it, it, it implies on the victor responsibilities. So frankly, I think the question is a difficult one um, for the United States. Um, clearly, the international community did not support the United States or any members of the coalition going beyond the United Nations mandate. And we must remember that there was a UN mandate for exactly what was followed. The irony is that many liberals in the United States who on the one hand resisted the move to war, then reversed field after the war and said, actually, we should take it further. We should assist the Kurds. We should go after Saddam Hussein. Now, it seems to me there's a contradiction here. Now, personally, I've come to the conclusion that, in fact, we do have a responsibility to the Kurds inside of Iraq and also to the democratic process inside of Kuwait. And so myself, I'm concerned with how President Bush has defined the new world order. It seems to me about crossing national boundaries and that once that's redressed, everything's fine and dandy. I think we do have a commitment to the democratic process in Kuwait. And personally, I would be concerned to see the al Sabah family remain in power in a system which is not democratic. And indeed, it's interesting to look, our soldiers that are returning back from the Gulf report of an incredible resistance that were, was in a sense almost democratically organized. And they have linked up with the former parliamentarians, many of whom were put in prison or who had to leave the country because of the al Sabah family. And it would be my view and hope that the United States government would support this process of democratization inside Kuwait, or at least uh, to allow these groups that struggled against the Iraqis, who did not flee to their wonderful palaces, to allow the mistaken government. Further, I think the irony, and this is a difficult thing, and I must say it causes concerns for myself, I try to avoid the Hitler analogy, but I wonder if we would have stopped after we had consumed, after we had pushed Hitler back into his country and allowed him to continue his domestic reign. And I think here there are some interesting and, and trying comparisons. The problem I think the international community has faced is now that we have pushed him back into his country, we've washed our hands of it in a sense. I think rather belatedly, President Bush has taken to the mantle of the, uh, the Kurds. However, I think it's something that he does um, carefully and without the zeal or the commitment that he might have. Uh, I think we have a national debate now to think about what are our future roles and purposes inside um, Iraq. I mean, is there a role or a mandate for some sort of legal tribunal which demands the removal of Saddam Hussein? Now, frankly, that's a more interventionist policy than the United States earlier took vis-a-vis -vis the Gulf. But I think it's a question that we have to address. In fact, the New World, Old, New World Order is not probably just about international consequences and about state-to-state -state conflict. It's also about conflict inside of states. It's also about states that treat their minorities in undemocratic fashions and, and ruthless, barbaric fashions, using chemical, chemical weapons, et cetera. Let me conclude by saying that I think this is an important debate, and I think we've outlined some of the issues which we can discuss. Let's take some early questions. If I can ask you, please, 
We've had a, a rather long beginning. Let's, if we could keep our questions short and brief, a statement is fine, but then let's, let's open it up for discussion if we can. Thank you. Yeah, I don't. I don't see anyone at the microphones first. I, everyone's leaving, so. Let me. Let me do this. No, actually, actually no. You know what we're going to do? We're, we're going to. You, you've had a, a yeah, very good shot ready. at it. So let's. Let's try. To, is anyone? No questions. Yeah. Okay. Would you grab a? Oh, here's one here. Would you go to a microphone, sir? Well, um, I'd like to start off. I'm saying I really regret that Noam Chomsky isn't here today. I think he would have. I know he would have presented a view that is much different than the two that were presented here. Um, and I, I hope that no one who is, if there's anyone here who hasn't um, either read him or seen him, I hope you're able to, um, to, to, get in touch with, uh, to get in touch with him. He'll be here next Tuesday. He'll be here next Tuesday. I'll, yes, that's right. Um, and um, uh, Professor Campbell, I, I have to say I don't understand why um, we're talking about pursuing um, further aggression in Iraq uh, against Saddam Hussein. You mentioned the possibility of him possibly using chemical weapons at some later time um, when when you had the U.S. who did use who did use chemical weapons in this war. He dropped napalm. They did use fuel air explosives on retreating troops that are um, outlawed by the Geneva Convention. Um, there was a slaughter over there. And what, how, how are you, I, I can't understand how you even get away in, in talking in the, in these sort of abstract um, terms that you are. Is that, is that the question? I, 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 I guess I don't understand. I, I, please, please tell me what's the, what's the, what's the basis of your analysis? Um, what, 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 what are your, what are your, what are your, what are your assumptions? I'm a, I'm a white European Teuton, so let me, let me, I think um, the, the first part of the question, I, clearly Saddam Hussein could not now use chemical weapons. I was talking about if this war had occurred six months or a year from now. I think the possibilities are very real. Um, the second question on fuel air explosives, I, I actually believe that there's a lot about this war that we do not know. And I think one of the troubling issues, the, tru the, troubling, the troubling issues is that I think that the American people have drawn an assessment from what happened without very much data. And in fact, I'm very interested to learn more as it comes out about the war. And I do have some concerns about the press guidelines. The, the third point, I don't think I said that I want further U.S. aggression inside Iraq, but I do think that it has to be an issue about the status of, of, of Saddam Hussein inside his country that has to be de debated in the United Nations. Um, I'm concerned, frankly, uh, about the domestic conditions inside the country, and I'm also concerned that we have a commitment that in Iraq. Um, All right. Let's. Uh, let's can, can, can I respond to the, the issue of the of the the gas the the uh, that Kurt referred to? Let's not forget that napalm was developed right here at Harvard. Okay, so let's cut the hypocrisy. Okay. Let, let me let me respond to this. That the I, I'm a little bit concerned. I'd like a little more clarification on this. That that when when Kurt when you point out that you think it's important for us to take into account that that there was the need to that if, in fact, we had waited six more months, that you're quite confident that he would have used gas, poison gas, and if we'd waited another three years, waited another three years to go after him, that he would have had nuclear weapons. That seems to me to suggest that a major element of the decision to go get him had to do with disarming him, uh, making sure he didn't ever use gas weapons or nuclear weapons, suggesting that therefore there was a pre-existent motivation to go get him. And, and yet on the other hand, I, don't hear, I hear you characterizing as somehow sort of a conspiracy theory of there being a whole built-up momentum and a plan somehow to go in and disarm him to keep him from attacking anybody in the region. And I'd like to know which of those two you really believe. 
I actually do believe that after the invasion of Kuwait by Iraq, that uh, from a fairly early period in the crisis, that it was President Bush's preferred option that we go to war. I do believe that, yes. Well, also, how do you account for the other documents in which they started talking about them as the, the ones that they ought to exercise their military option against? I, I, to be perfectly honest, I, I could not make sense of that part of your discussion. And I'd, I'd have to see the documents, and I, I really wasn't clear what you were speaking about. I would just, I would, I would but, you know, Dan, though, but you know what? We're going to hear a few more questions, and then we'll go back to you. Go ahead. Uh, I'd like to ask two questions, if I might. First one, uh, 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 Mr. Sheehan, I agree mostly uh, with what you say, and I've, uh, I heard you speak in last October at the uh, Arlington Street Church, and your, uh, what you repeated tonight uh, has been uh, presented to Professor Nye at the Cambridge Forum in uh, about a week after you spoke. And uh, he seemed to, he didn't comment specifically on it. He just said that it seemed to make sense. And I asked, I was going to ask him this afternoon, but he, uh, I didn't get a chance. And uh, Father uh, Nay, uh, Hayer, uh, I presented it to him, and he uh, sort of lapped it off, and, and he uh, said that he's known you for 20 years, and uh, you always have documents. And I don't know what to say to that, but, you know, I, I just want to you know, be aware of this. That's, that's why we have to have won every case we've ever prosecuted at the okay, Christian well. Institute. We have documents. <laughs> so. You can win cases like that. The, 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 two, of the, two of the documents that I'm talking about specifically, one is a June 18, 1990, United States, uh, excuse me, no, a, a January 1990 document, an official document inside the Pentagon, the United States Army, entitled A Strategic Force for the 1990s and Beyond. And there is also a June 1990 Department of Air Force document called the Air Force and United States National Security, Global Reach, Global Power. And in those documents is where they, in June of 1990 and January of 1990, talk about the retooling of the United States military to direct it against potential third world countries that would interfere with the access to strategic raw materials for the northern industrial states. And in both documents, specifically discuss Kuwait and Iraq as examples of what they're talking about. And what I'm suggesting is there are additional documents which the not un illegitimate concern that you have about being concerned about whether uh, Saddam Hussein has gas warfare uh, capacities over and above what he's already used and whether or not he's developing a nuclear weapon, mm -hmm. all of which were being discussed as reasons for figuring out how to develop a way to attack him and to get rid of him. Very much as you remember in the Pentagon Papers, after we were told over and over again by the executive branch in both parties that there was this unprovoked assault upon the, the Turner Gay and the USS Henry Knox that just absolutely mandated our intercession, was in fact was demonstrated to have been completely fabricated. That was all I'm saying is that the more documents having been one of the five attorneys for the New York Times who got to read the, New, the, the Pentagon Papers, you know, that when you see these documents and you see what they're talking about and they're trying to figure out how to develop a rationale to feed to the American people to justify a military action like that, I'm suggesting that these people are not entitled, when you say we, there's a whole lot we don't know about, in light of that, they're not entitled to a presumption of legitimacy. They have lost their legitimacy, and we need to have this. Sir, sir, since we have a long line and you've asked one, could I ask the next gentleman to ask a question, if that's all right? I was just wondering, Mr. Campbell, why you so blindly accept what is put forward as the reasons for the conflict occurring in the Gulf, and why you, do not, why you only look at it as a separate incident, apart from what has been put out on PBS over the past two weeks, last night in Bill Moyer's piece and the week before in the Frontline piece, about how it all goes back and why you ignore the documents that present this information and why you only say that the, the Gulf situation was an isolated incident regarding oil drilling over, you said, a, a four to five year period, I believe, and why you, as a professor, do not look beyond what is put in front of you and what is easy to believe as opposed to what is more difficult to believe. Let me answer the, the, at least the, the factual part of the question as best I can. I, I do think that the administration and the president had difficulty making the case uh, 
to the American public about why we were going to war. In fact, every week during the crisis, there was another reason. And I think, in a sense, that was one of the, the great weaknesses of the administration's campaign. I think their greatest ally in this endeavor was the fact that Saddam Hussein was a, an evil dictator from central casting, in a sense, that in every situation where it looked like the international community was crumbling, um, he would do something, do something especially heinous with children or you know, hostages that I think regenerated the, the nature of the coalition. So I think it wasn't so much what we were fighting for in this case, and, and I, have a tro I have problems with that because I believe the United States should fight for democracy. I have, I have greater support for our mission, particularly in, in Europe as it has been defined traditionally, um, as opposed to what we were fighting against. And I clearly think we made a case for what we were fighting against, but not a very persuasive case about what we were fighting for. Okay. But, excuse me, but you, again, are centralizing the issue okay, that it was simply, no, let me finish, that you are simply Okay. Um, I guess it's only appropriate given that Ronald Reagan was a president from Central Casting. But um, <laughs> in terms of the just war idea, I mean, if one of the criteria of just war is that it be the means of last resort, to argue that it would have become the means of last resort is basically tantamount to saying I'm going to die, so I might as well kill myself now rather than waiting for it to happen inevitably. Um, so I do question the just, the just war theory. And the fact is, if we had waited three months, where was Saddam Hussein going to get the means to develop these chemical weapons under a complete international embargo? It's a good question. I'm generally in agreement with, with uh, Mr. Sheehan's perspective. However, being in agreement with that, I also feel that the argument of the peace and justice community also needs to be held to rigorous standards. And I think the idea of demonstrating to the American public that this was not a just war, well, it's a bit too late. I mean, it, I think a lot of people realize that Vietnam was a mistake at around 1973, which was, I think, eight years after the conflict began. So I'm, I'm wondering, that to be able to show people that it wasn't just now seems perhaps easier, but also less significant. The second thing is a, is a more pessimistic, perhaps human nature question, which is given that the world order which you describe is in fact the world order that George Bush wishes, wishes to develop, what about the prospect that that is a world order that many Americans wish to develop? Which means the task of converting them to a different world order, which is either theological or moral or even secular, becomes a much more difficult one. Because if I'm preaching to a room of 300 Americans who happen to agree, what if 200 million Americans, in fact, think that that new world order is a fairly nice one, one to look for, gives us a certain feeling of power in the world, and will in fact support that. What then? Well, I ask everyone to be brief from that, so we have a lot of people to hear. I, I think that that is one of the most persuasive reasons why I don't believe that you can appeal to a community of people who make up 6% of the population of the human family and who have access to and utilize 52% of the non-renewable resources that are developed on the planet every year from a strictly utilitarian perspective. You can't just argue that, well, you know, it's in your self-interest to do this. That because if, in fact, you press that argument, those 8% of the population that control 87% of those resources will just redistribute them a little more fairly inside this country. That is why I believe you need to reach out to an entirely different ethic. You have to not go for a self-interested utilitarian analysis, which for the most part tends to characterize a secular left analysis in labor organizing with the classes who don't have access to as many of the resources because they can eventually be bought off by a major power group like this. I think you have to appeal to the other ethical system to which almost all of the people in the United States have been exposed. And that is the ethical system that they encounter in their churches and in their synagogues. That I believe that that is the alternative non-self-interested motivation that can cause people to really demand change on behalf of others, not just on behalf of their own self-interest. And that's why I think this analysis that I'm talking about is so important to be grasped and why the religious social ministry community has such a heavy obligation to demythologize all of this stuff and communicate to the rest of the people in the country what the good news really is about the potential future for the human family as a single unified family. 
Thank you, Dan. It looks like you've got a text to read, so let's... No, not at all. Okay. I, uh, Mr. Sheehan mentioned the Caucasian Alliance several times, and I was just wondering, did such decidedly non-Caucasian allies of the U.S., such as Turkey, uh, Egypt, Israel, Saudi Arabia, Italy, Greece, do they have any part in the Caucasian Alliance? And if not, why not? Well, I would, I would point out to you, for example, that... Uh, that the next secretary of the Navy for Reagan and Bush, James Webb, when he talked about the joining in of these countries in the resolutions in the United Nations to support this activity, said, those re we bought and paid for those resolutions. They're not worth anything. Baker used our money, the taxpayers' money, to buy them. I believe that the, Reg the Bush administration... Could you answer my question? Yes. That they, in fact, if you, in fact, forgive millions and bill actually billions of dollars of debt to Egypt in exchange for its vote in the Security Council, that's not exactly a good faith vote. If you give $140 million in loans to China in exchange for their vote, that's not an unbiased vote. If you promise $7 billion to the Soviet Union in exchange for their vote, that's not exactly an unbiased vote. If you promise but military then, aid to what, Colombia. What, what, what my question is, why are you using the racial expression, the Caucasian alliance, when it so clearly includes so many countries that are not Caucasian? Well, because, because, in, because in fact, it doesn't. The, the, the Saudi Arabia, the family, the, the Saudi family that runs Saudi Arabia to the, the detriment of their entire population, or the Sabah family in Kuwait that lives in golden fauceted palaces while the rest of their people are starving to death I in didn't the street. include Kuwait. You can get them to do almost anything you want. You can buy them to vote for anything you want. Now, that doesn't mean that those people accept that. And when they refer in their documents to the Northern Industrial Alliance, you can bet your boots that they're not talking about Egypt, and they're not talking about any of the other countries. When they use the term themselves, the Northern Industrial Alliance, you're talking about a group that is very specifically talking about a particular economic alliance. So they're excluding such countries as Italy and Greece, you, you claim? No, what, no. Okay. I, just, how you, how you know what, you guys can, can, right, can right. continue this d definition about where Greece fits in. Right. Okay, please. Uh, Mr. Sheehan, uh, you conclude your remarks of with some uh, painting a, a rather eloquent picture of, of some terms which uh, I think you included cosmetology and some other things in there. And I just... Uh, which has to do with theology. You know. Right. So, <laughs> which is, which, is, which so anyway, one ignores at one's own peril, you, I might add. You uh, talked about this force in the world that was out there. And I just, yes. at this very instant, there's probably 10% uh, of the Iraq population is high telling it as fast as their uh, feet can take them out of the country. Uh, is the this force that you were talking about, is that what is driving them or attracting them? Or what would you pass judgment on why they're trying to leave the country? And I suspect that in a couple of years we'll see a lot of them in Cambridge and Somerville running our gas stations. So uh, they will realize their dream I've, sometime in, a fort, in the future. Well, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not exactly not exactly certain about what, what you're saying here. What, what I'm saying very clearly Why is are they that, trying to leave? That's, I think that's... As well, I, thought you were I, asking, I thought you were talking about the, cosmo, the cosmology. What, I, what I'm suggesting is that... What force is driving them? That, uh, that, you know, massive destruction of the infrastructure of their country. You know, the massive destruction, the continued threat of massive retaliation inside the country, which was one of the things that should have been contemplated before the military action was started. In the same way, you know, that the, the destruction that was heaped upon the people in Kuwait was, in fact, the potentially avoidable. The same was shooting them with his, uh, from his helicopters and so on to keep them in the country? Or, I mean, I'm losing your logic there. It doesn't, I'm uh, sure doesn't you add are. Up. I've noticed that you are. It doesn't you know, add the, up. Uh, my, that there, there, there are two, there, I, what I'm hearing, I don't mean to be, there seem to be two separate parts to your question. One which seems to be, I think, somewhat gratuitously derogatory about the cosmology because you apparently don't know anything about it, but that's all right. Well, you know, you can read Tehar to Chardin, you can talk to Ralph Potter. All have our own be, troops. But, but the second part of your question about what's driving the people out is massive military application of power. And when you have a group of countries like the United Kingdom, the United States, and the other countries that aren't coincidentally Caucasian, making the decisions unilaterally as to how the borders should be drafted inside the Middle East for a whole series of aboriginal peoples and nomadic peoples, I'm suggesting to you that when they decide they're going to enforce those 
these externally imposed borders through military applications of power, you're going to have a lot of people running all kinds of directions. You're going to have the Palestinians running around trying to figure out where they're supposed to go. Be, You're going to have the Kuwaitis running around. That would be a pretty around. hard sell to those people, I think, your, your logic. Okay. Next, next question, sir. Fairly, fairly simple question, Mr. Campbell. Um, when the U.S. State Department hid April Glaspie from the world for six months, was that their contribution to this open debate you described? And were the Pentagon press restrictions also part of that contribution to this debate? Well, they still haven't released her transcript. Yeah. I'm not sure if we know enough about the press restrictions to make a judgment. I, I know that... Are you kidding me? I, 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 know that, I, I know that from what I've heard from journalists who've returned, they feel that it was onerous and that they were unable to get stories out and there were problems associated. Um, I've also talked to some military commanders uh, who themselves felt that some of the restrictions were onerous. Um, the agreement, as it was worked out between the news organizations and the military in the months um, preceding the war, um, were detailed and there were signed agreements about how to proceed. Um, I think one of the debates that has to happen in the wake of this war is to review these policies. And I think there has been a tendency since Vietnam to try to constrain public view of war. And I think perhaps um, that is a problem. The second point um, which you dealt with concerning the, how the State Department handled April Glasby, I think history will show that the, the State Department made some fairly crucial errors of assessment about what to expect from Saddam Hussein. And I think um, perhaps April Glaspie was involved in that in some way. Ironically, if you look at her career, it's interesting because she was one of the voices in the State Department that actually spoke out against arming the Iraqis in the 1980s. She's the first woman, woman ambassador to a Gulf state. She's thought of as being actually quite, in a sense, progressive about these questions about arming the region. Um, the question about whether she was muzzled, whether she was a good State Department employee, um, what actually was said inside the meeting, I don't think we know yet, and I'm actually curious to find out. Let's see. Do you want, yes. I have a follow-up to this question. Sure. P.S. Salinger, um, we met um, Mr. Salinger on um, People Are Talking, and he had the document between April Glassby and the Iraqi officials. He had an original transcript. April did not take notes of that meeting, but the Iraqi officials did. And what turned out to be was that um, Saddam Hussein just wanted the money Kuwait owed him for the oil. And Kuwait first said, <laughs> Ku Kuwait first said that they would pay um, um, Iraq the money, and then they decided against it. And when um, at first, I'm, I don't know, I'm, I'm sure you can clarify a few things about it for me. So um, do you have, I'm sorry, I'm talking have a about question? the country of Iraq, all right? But yeah. what I'm. Yeah, but that's all right, fine. Do you have a question? Um, Just ignore it. Yes, I did. Did you know about, I mean, have you heard about these documents about Pierre Salinger? Bush knew about um, the, that Kuwait was going to pay Iraq, pay this money, all right? But Bush already had planned on sending the troops down there. And he stuck with that plan. Well, I, I don't and think it would be useful use of our time to get into the history, which all it's, – it's very vague and actually quite murky. No, but, but if there were documents me, stating let, that let me, Kuwait – I'll just – I'll state okay. what I know and then we can talk about it. As I understand it, the Kuwaitis actually funded Iraq um, or encouraged them in their war against Iran, as did many of the Gulf states. However, once the war was over and, and Iraq had actually spent a tremendous amount of money – um, Iraq was quite concerned about the duplicity or the perceived duplicity of other of the Gulf states who refused to lower their Gulf, uh, their Gulf uh, excuse me, their crude production, and they did not. In fact, as you state, the Kuwaitis did not pay money that the Iraqis felt was owed them. Um, so, in fact, indeed, Iraq did have claims on Kuwait, and there had been problems in the year preceding, indeed, increasingly heated meetings between Iraqis and Kuwaitis.
Um, I think my own view is that it was largely off the radar scope of the United States at that juncture. Um, but honest people can uh, disagree about this. I don't believe there was any um, conspiracy. The second point about the transcripts, let me just finish if I can. There are two transcripts that we know of. A transcript is a, is a vague. We have something that comes from Saddam Hussein, which frankly I doubt the validity of. And if you listen to what, what April Glasby said in her Senate testimony is that parts of what Saddam Hussein released are true, but there are edited parts out of it. She, as soon as she returned from her meeting, and it was her, uh, it was about an hour and a half meeting, she sent a cable back to Washington, which um, at this juncture is still classified, and I think it'll probably remain classified for a long time. I think what Pierre Salinger had was a copy of the transcript released by Saddam Hussein. I don't know of anyone who's seen the actual memo of the conversation called a memcon um, that went from uh, April Glaspie's residence in, the, in uh, 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 Iraq to Washington, to the State Department. Thanks. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, two points to address to uh, Professor Campbell. Um, if the main objective, or it looks now the only objective, really, of Operation Desert Storm was to extricate Saddam Hussein from Kuwait, uh, why were the numerous uh, negotiating proposals initiated by Saddam, such as before the war, to uh, leave Kuwait pending uh, the uh, convocation of a Middle East peace conference. That was the main uh, uh, withholding point of, of simply just unilaterally withdrawing. He, he insisted that there be this uh, Middle East peace conference. On the eve of the ground war, he offered to withdraw from Kuwait if simply the United Nations sanctions against uh, Iraq were dropped. Um, if the, the American diplomatic uh, position seems to have been consistently surrender or die, capitulate or, or be at war with us, and, and many of you will die, hundreds of thousands of you will die, um, why wasn't there a more serious effort to pursue negotiations? We'll never know how serious they were, but it seems as if the, the Bush administration uh, pers uh, took the diplomatic stance that precluded any possible real negotiation. Uh, the second point would be, uh, after the uh, ground war began, you mentioned, some, well, earlier on you mentioned a need for a war crimes tribunal involving Iraq, and a point that would be suggested for a discussion in a war crimes tribunal would be the American bombing of the retreating Iraqi soldiers. Many of uh, the, the column, which was something like seven miles long, it was described as the uh, road to detain a uh, beach on spring break by one of the U.S. pilots. Uh, that uh, convoy included many, it's, it's believed, uh, retreating uh, foreign nationals that just si simply wanted to leave the scene of battle, which they anticipated would happen in Kuwait City. Um, that convoy was bombed, the, the, the lead vehicles in the convoy were bombed, and the, the, the tail vehicles were bombed, paralyzing everyone in between. Um, and it's said that, that many of the, the most of the casualties of the Iraqis were suffered in that bombing. Uh, the, military, the American uh, Air Force and Navy planes returned repeatedly, uh, virtually incinerated a uh, seven-mile-long convoy of uh, essentially defenseless soldiers. Uh, it, was, it would be hard to even call them an army. It was a disorganized, dispirited, uh, essentially defenseless group of people, and de bombing that sort of group of people is considered a war crime. Would you comment on that, please? Um, the, the first part of your question concerning um, whether there were serious negotiations, when we talk about capitulation, total capitulation, I personally don't believe it was capitulation. He was still going to remain in power in Iraq. He was just going to leave uh, Kuwait. Um, my own view was that... My own view is that, is that in fact, the, the attempts at getting negotiations going on were not just conducted by the Bush administration. Even Ramsey Clark, when he left um, Iraq, was quite dispirited and concerned. I, I believe that Saddam Hussein was prepared for war. I think he's a man who had traveled very little outside of his own country. Um, I think he, took, he looked at two historical experiences, the American defeat in Vietnam and also the American bombing of the... Uh, the uh, uh, barracks in, in Beirut and believed, in fact, if you, if you read part of the transcripts that, was, that were released, the part that hasn't been focused on is that he honestly believed that he could take 10, 20,000 casualties and inflict a bloody nose on the United States and they would withdraw in dishonor. 
Um, I would sort of harken back to the statement made, made by General Schwarzkopf in his concluding uh, press conference when he suggested that you know he was a bad diplomatist, he was a bad military leader, uh, and in fact an all-around very poor national leader in peace or in war. Uh, I think he badly miscalculated. I think most of the states within the coalition believed that there would be no honest form of negotiation which he would uh, he would engender or consider the possibility of leaving Kuwait. I think he wanted to hold on to Kuwait, and I think he was determined to do so. But again, people can disagree. Um, Pardon me? Yeah, I know. I'm just trying to. Um, I, I, I must say, uh, I, I, I think s some of the scenes of the retraining troops um, were troubling. Uh, and I, um, I, I think always you have to remember that in a war, in war, it, it is a horrible, horrible, it, it is a travesty. And I, I think back to what General Schwarzkopf said, that you know, war is a blasphemy and it's a horrific thing. Um, I think, I think that the, the last few days of the war were um, confused. And I, um, I, I think that the question of whether we went too far or not far enough is still being debated today. In fact, many argue that, that there was a belief that the military was completely um, disgorged, uh, destroyed. In fact, the military has been very efficient against the Kurds and against the Shia rebellion in the south. And so, in fact, I think Iraq's military capability now is stronger than we had anticipated at the close of the war. Yes. Uh, during this war, I uh, found myself in the position of being the uh, first vice president of an organ organization called Project SOS to support our soldiers. This uh, group got together spontaneously to show support for the troops back home because we didn't want to see a recapitulation of what happened during the Vietnam uh, year years. Uh, I had the impression, and I think many of the members of this group did, very early on that the uh, representatives of the so-called peace movement were running scared. And this was borne out by the absence of, mo of uh, demonstrations by the peace movement in Boston and the State House within three weeks of when the war began. Uh, and this was confirmed again tonight, Mr. Sheehan, by what you had to say, the uh, blatant cynicism of suggesting to your cohorts, many of whom are in the audience here, many of whom uh, are members of the so-called peace movement, that really should be called an anti-American movement because that's where your real strength lies. Your cynicism... Isn't this the let same finish. argument you made let me the finish here. Let me finish. You let your cohorts speak. Let me speak. Yeah. The cynicism, the blatant cynicism of saying to these people, these left-wing agnostics, yeah, sir, these left-wing agnostics, a yeah, I'll give you a question What's just like question? this guy gave you a question. What's the question? The qu say to these people that they should, in fact, That's a question? become, no, become sir, the leaders of God, the leaders of God, so they can put to their left-wing agenda. I'll My question is the okay. following. How is the Christic Institute going to pay off the $1.2 million judgment against oh. it in the court in Florida? For your phony documents, Buster. That's a, that... Uh, I, I would suggest to you that if you if you if that one thing I will tell you is how that the fact is that this afternoon is that a successful this situation is, this afternoon at five o'clock the Costa Rican federal government served murder extradition demand for extradition on John Hall to the United States State Department in Washington D.C. and the sole the sole ground the sole ground on which Judge King entered his order was that there was absolutely no possible evidence that would support any belief that John Hall had anything to do with the Lepenka bombing. He is now in the process of being arrested by United States Marshals and will be removed from the United States. And in fact, the $1.2 million judgment will be set aside by the Federal Circuit Court of Appeals in the same way that the rulings of the Federal Court in the Silkwood case for two separate judges were set aside before we won the $10.5 million judgment against them. <laughs> All right, last, last two questions, last two questions. Let's, let's take them together if we can and then answer them together. Sit in here. Go, go, why don't you go ahead, sir, and then you, please. And can we keep these, sh people are wanting to leave, so keep them brief. Yes, very leave. brief. Uh, I would like to understand where you base your assertion that uh, the capability of uh, Saddam Hussein to use chemical weapons was not ready at the time of the war and would have been ready a little later given the fact that we know that he had used chemical weapons at war before. Also, let me raise a question of, or a statement, if you wish, of hypocrisy on this issue here. The Kurds that are fighting 
Hussein in Iraq are seen through certain eyes, and the Kurds that are fighting Turkey a few miles north are seen with a different eye. The aggression of Iraq against Kuwait is seen with one eye that mobilizes 30 nations to create such a mess in the Middle East, and the aggression of Turkey occupying a good part of the independent nation of Cyprus has not been addressed. First of all, the question, I'll answer real quickly. The, the technical question, it is clear that Saddam Hussein did use chemical weapons against um, Iran and also uh, against the Kurds inside his own country. The question is whether he was able to put those chemical or biological munitions on rockets, on what are called you know, Scud missiles, and there's still some uncertainty about that. He stated in um, the United Nations in the last day that it, or two that he did. That yeah, he well, I, I know. He, he stated a lot of things that actually have, tur are, have turned out to be exaggeration. A, a, second a second issue concerned his indigenous nuclear capability, which is still hard to determine. There are some um, concerns that he might have I some... didn't raise that. Okay, you didn't raise that. Okay, the, the second question. I do believe that the Bush policy, the administration policy about the Kurds raises a lot of questions concerning national groups, not just in Turkey or in uh, Iraq, but also in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. We have a number of groups in the Soviet Union that would like to secede from the USSR, also in Eastern Europe. We have the question of occupation in other countries. And I, the problem is, that, you know, when do you address some issues and you refuse to address others? And, and it does raise clear problems. I think the issue here now of defining a military responsibility to protect the Kurds and to set up an autonomous zone inside Iraq is dangerous in the sense that it creates, um, it creates a commitment that it's hard to see the end of. Also, I'd like to have the international community behind us, and I'm, I know Britain is and other states, but I'm concerned the fact that many of the states that supported us in the war are not as concerned with the state of the peace subsequently in the region. Do I? Okay. Uh, in this new world order where uh, evil dictatorships are rehabilitated, uh, is, it, is it realistic to hope that the next candidate for rehabilitation would be <laughs> the government of Turkey for its uh, committing genocide and deportation of Armenians from their land, for occupation of Cyprus, and for oppression of his minorities, the minorities in Turkey? This, this is very much related to part of the, the last question. That I, I think that, that for George Bush uh, to be asserting that what he's really planning to do here is to enforce in some kind of even-handed manner the rules of international law is not believed by anyone. The fact is that his administration, which he ran as much as Ronald Reagan did, has been completely condemned by the International World Court in order to pay reparations. They aren't planning to pay these reparations, and they're demanding that reparations be paid on the part of the, the Iraqi government. Now, the fact of the matter is that that is one of the major issues that was motivating, to some sense, Saddam Hussein. Say, look, if I'm occupying this territory, let's have a debate and discuss the United States and Israel withdraw, withdrawing from the Palestinian territories. Let's talk about why the Israelis didn't obey the resolution after resolution after resolution of the United Nations about what they were doing in Lebanon. What he was trying to do, I believe, in part, was trying to reestablish establish himself as a major leader in the Middle East, using as an alternative theory to the Iranians' theory of attacking the United States and the West on the grounds of Islamic fundamentalism, attacking them as the great Satan and attacking them culturally and religiously, what he was suggesting is that you substitute for that line of attack an attack on the United States and Israel and others for being hypocrites, for refusing to obey international law, and that if he was going to be compelled to obey international law, he would do so so long as the rules were applied evenly. So I think that what you see, and I would state this as my point in closing, is that there is no credibility whatsoever to George Bush's assertion that the New World Order that he is talking about 
has to do with enforcing legitimate United Nations resolutions as opposed to coerced, bribed, forced positions on other countries, or that in fact he has the slightest intention of obeying international law in the future. And so therefore the new world order is indeed revealed in the internal documents, which has to do with having the United States military funding continue at the levels that it is out of our taxpayers' pockets to maintain a massive military power on the part of the United States to enforce the seizing of resources around the world from third world countries on behalf of this northern industrial alliance, which will in fact include part of the Soviet Union, Eastern Europe, the new European economic community, and the United States. And I think what you're going to see is a major movement, for example, inside the Trilateral Commission to start to substitute the third leg of the triad to pull it away from Japan and move it into Eastern Europe and into the Soviet Union. And the new Trilateral Commission thesis of how they're going to develop state capitalism in the world is going to be this Northern Industrial Alliance. And there's a major potential confrontation coming up with Japan, who is going to be excluded from this new world order. And why? Not because they're not capitalists, but because they, in fact, are not Caucasians. And that's exactly what you're getting ready to see. This is a very old world order. Can I ask, and Germany is sir, can I answer your question? Uh, and then, and then we'll close. Part of the question for me is unfair because I, I uh, actually grew up in Fresno, down the street from William Saroy, and I spent almost two years in the in Soviet Armenia. And I, as I'm an Odar, but I speak high. And uh, I myself hope that uh, part of the new world order will come. We, the new world order, and I think we might agree on this, should not be about war. It cannot be defined by war. It has to be defined what we do in the peace. And my hope is that part of the New World Order, if there is such a thing, it's, it looks to me more like the New World Disorder, frankly, but we'll come to terms with the question of groups that are vying for autonomy um, within empires. And I'd like to see in the future, and not the distant future, in my lifetime, in fact soon, an autonomous and free independent Armenia. Let me just close by thanking you can all I for ask coming. Can one question, please, if you let me, please? I'm, I'm afraid we're going to close. Thank can you. I Can't, no. No, we, we really. I want to thank everyone for coming. This has been very interesting, and I hope, I hope the, I hope the Kennedy School of Government will uh, sponsor more such forum.